How great, how great, how great, how great is your stand. How great, sing with me, and how great, how great, is how great is our God. How and great, how 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 great is our God. How great, how great. This is Rev. Michelle Mann. Well, this is a real thing from ancient times, but it's not a holy thing. It's an unholy thing linked to the enemy, but but you see how real the enemy is. In Revelation, Pergamon, to the church of Pergamon, he says, the throne of Satan, where Satan dwells, the throne of Satan. Why? Pergamon was a pagan place. You went to the mountain of Pergamon. You had you had all these pagan things, and, I, and I, the, the key thing they had was called was the altar of Pergamon. The altar of Pergamon is an altar to the god Zeus, the head of the gods, and the Bible calls it the throne of Satan. As the gospel spreads to the Roman Empire, eventually people start abandoning all these things. The altar of Pergamon falls into disuse, it falls into ruins, it's gone. It, the throne of Satan is dormant for about almost 2,000 years. But oh. then what happens? Then in the 19th century, a man starts uncovering the throne of Satan the altar of Pergamon. And he sends the pieces back to his homeland. In his homeland, they reconstruct the altar of Zeus, the altar of Pergamon, throne of Satan. Where, what was his homeland? His homeland was Germany. When, when Hitler was railing, and you see him, you know, railing satanically, he is standing on his platform that he had especially built, which is, mod, is a recreation of the altar of Pergamon. Oh. It's the throne of Satan. Here is Hitler is speaking from the throne of Satan oh in Nuremberg. God. Oh. Remember, the enemy hates the Jewish people, wants to destroy the Jewish people. There's no accident this is all happening. He wants to wipe them out. So he uses Hitler as this man who's possessed. You have the armies of the West, the American allied army coming from the West. You have the Red Army coming from the East. And they all, it's like the whole world's being drawn to the city where it all began, the devastation, the place of the throne of Satan. What happens now? What happens to, what happens to the world? What happens is America and Russia are in Berlin. Berlin, the enemy wants destruction, and he wants the world to be destroyed, and, he, and so and he's the god of division. What happens is Berlin is divided in two, and that the, the division of the entire world is going to begin in the city of the altar of Satan. It's gonna, from that, it's going to come the Cold War. From that, Berlin is divided, Germany is divided, the world is divided as two warring camps ready for destruction we almost, the, almost well, let, me, let, me, let me just fast forward for a second. What we're going to see in this one is that all of us here, our lives were almost destroyed linked to the altar of Satan. That everyone who's watching this, I tell you, either your life would have been killed, would have been destroyed, or your life never would have happened if the enemy had his way. The enemy is the destroyer. So first you have the entire war, our, most of our lives we grew up, we went in air raid drills, you know, you know, the, get, you know, get your bomb shelters, because there was this threat of destruction over the whole world beginning in Berlin where the altar was. This was the center of the Cold War, the same city where it was. But what happened to that altar? When, you know, the Nazis had it, what happened now? What happened was the altar at the end of the war became, went in, passed from the Nazis and went into the hands of the Red Army, the Soviet Union. So you went from Hitler, the Nazism, the worst evil then, now it goes to the key evil of modern times. They have the throne of Satan. They have the altar. And, so, you know, and in fact, that's when the Soviet Union really comes out. That's when, that's when you have not just you know, you, the Soviet Union, you have, that's when the Soviet Union begins taking over. That's when all of a sudden Eastern Europe becomes, is under the iron grip of the Soviet Union. Then the world, and then China becomes. And then one, one out of every three people in the world is under this bondage. Of, of the power that has the throne of Satan. And so, and you know, what was, you know, in the times of, of, of the Bible or, or in, the, in between the Testaments, you had that throne with Antiochus when he sat on the Temple Mount, the altar of Zeus, same thing. And what did he do? He banned the word of God. He persecuted God's people. Well, what happened all over the world? What happened through communism, which had the throne? They banned the word of God. They persecuted God's people, threw God's people into prison camps, made it illegal to follow God. Same thing. Who's doing that? Satan's doing that. And at the same time, the Soviet Union 
What else are they against? They're against Christians? I mean, communism? What else were they against? They were against Jews. They, hate, they were the chief, if you remember, it's not so long ago, they were the arch enemy of Israel. They tried to destroy Israel. They funded all the terror. They funded every enemy of Israel. They, start, they helped start wars to destroy Israel. So where, who's that? That's Satan. They had the throne of Satan. Not only that, in, here's something else. In 19... 48, now the, now, the, now the altar is still in Berlin, but it's under the Soviet Union's power. But in 1948, they actually take the altar from East Berlin and bring it to the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union actually has the altar now. Now? Well, no. Well, there's, there's more to it. Oh, my. There's more to it. Where's that altar? Yeah. And uh, so... I, I mean, my mind's going crazy because uh, all the players, you just, you know, yeah. we've been there and done that. And it sounds a little bit what's going on in America right now. My God, oh, my there's God, a lot. what's oh, oh, going oh. on? We get to the last part. Yeah, That's, you're, okay. you're, my brain's <laughs> yes. going to explode. Oh, <laughs> boy. Okay, yeah, they're, Rabbi, they're, keep going. So, so, so the year they take it, they take, they, it was in Berlin up till 1948, then they move it. Uh -huh. Well, in 1948, suddenly the world is brought to a brink of potential destruction. It's the Berlin crisis. The Soviet Union cuts off Berlin. There's a whole thing going before your America. It lasts till about 1949. Now the, now the altar's in Russia. You don't have any more problems like that in Berlin until they return the altar to Berlin, which I'm going to mention in a moment. What happens, but here's something else about, about communism. Marx. There's something about Karl Marx. Karl Marx was the son of rabbis. At one point, he considered, he considered Christianity, but he, turned, he rejected Christianity. And he did something. Now listen, listen to what Karl Marx wrote. He wrote kind of a poem. Listen to what he wrote. He said, a God has snatched from me everything. Nothing but revenge is left to me. I will build my throne high overhead. Cold, tremendous shall its summit be. I will build my throne high. What does God say that the enemy said? He said, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne. That's what Karl, it's like Satan is speaking as he spoke through Hitler, is speaking through Karl Marx. I will build my throne. And then what does he say? He goes on to say in, in what Marx wrote, the prince of darkness has sold it to me, the, this sword. He has sold me a sword. And it beats the time. It gives me the signs. Ever more boldly, I play the dance of death. And then in the poem, he, he, Marx speaks to humanity. He says, I have power to crush you. The abyss yawns in darkness. You will sink down and I will follow laughing, whispering your ears, descend, come with me. I bring the world to ruin. What does the Bible say about Satan? It says, who is this one who, who brings, who destroys cities, brings the world to desolation? So here now is the next move of how, you, know, you take, the Bible is real, it's serious. When it says something about the devil, it's real. And so here you have that going on. Now, what happens, what, what happens, one, one other thing here. There's a boy who is born in, in Georgia, not our Georgia, but their Georgia. His name is Bessarian, Bessarianus, Yugoshvili. He, he joins the Bolsheviks. He drops the name, his name, and takes up the name Man of Steel, which, it, which is Stalin. Here is now Joseph Stalin. <laughs> Joseph Stalin became the dictator, the ruler over this, with the throne of Satan in his country now, in his nation. He is now communism. You know, when, when, when Russia takes this in 1948, now it seals the grip on the Iron Curtain. All these nations are under communism. Stalin is ruling, he is throwing people, he's killing millions of people, throwing Christians in, hating the Jews, all these things. He was, now here, here's the thing, the altar of Satan was unearthed in 1878. The same, that, Joseph Stalin was born in 1878, the same year that the altar of Satan comes back in the world. A little baby is born who's going to be used of Satan. And so now, what happens here now is another thing. We said that the altar of Zeus, or Pergamon, was an altar of burnt offerings. It's the altar of, in, and, what it, and the word in Greek is holocaust. So we've got the holocaust with Hitler. Now it's in the power of the Soviet Union. And there's one other phrase that's used. When you hear the word holocaust, there's two, there's two applications. One is what happened to the Jewish people under Hitler. The other phrase is nuclear holocaust. 
So this Satan is bent on destruction and burning and fire. What happens? The year after Russia gets the altar, they get the power of nuclear holocaust. It becomes now the world is armed and most of us grew up with a threat of nuclear holocaust over the enemy would want to destroy every person in this room everybody watching and so here begins this new age of that now now what happens is now in 1958 they re Russia returns the altar to East Berlin still under their control but now it's back in the city that it was all of a sudden, there's been no issues, in, uh, no conflicts in Berlin, but all of a sudden, in 1958, all of a sudden there's another heating up, there's, there's a, the world is brought again to another brink, centering on Berlin where the altar is, as Khrushchev demands that, that America gets out of Berlin. All the Allies get out of Berlin. He gives them six months. Eisenhower, there's a threat back and forth, and this conflict goes on. You can read it, this is the second Berlin crisis. When the altars return, this last into Kennedy's, into Kennedy's reign and Kennedy's presidency. Kennedy, so what, here's what happened. In the beginning of Kennedy's presidency, 1961, Khrushchev gives, actually that's when he might have said get out. Now he gives Kennedy six months to get out of Berlin. Kennedy responds by activating 150,000 soldiers. And, so, and this, for a future conflict in Berlin centered on how the whole world is centering on destruction over where the, the city of the altar. And now August 13th, 1961, a barbed wire fence goes in the middle of Berlin, divided up. Then comes wall, the Berlin Wall. Shortly after the wall goes up, there's a standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union on each side of the wall. I mean, they could see each other at I mean, different times. Kennedy is told that they, we don't have the means to defend Berlin except by using nuclear weapons. That's how he's counseled. The general next to him says, he says, listen, you might as well strike because it's going to be atomic war, so you go nuclear. America is preparing for nuclear war. Khrushchev is on the other side. They're preparing for nuclear war. All focusing in the middle of it is the altar that would bring destruction. We almost were destroyed, every one of us, that from, that from where that altar was, number one, right there. What happens is, in 1962, next year, which almost destroyed, this is the closest we ever came to destroying the world. Almost wiped out everyone. Here's what happened. In May, Khrushchev approaches Fidel Castro to put, w to put missiles on Cuba that could strike America. The plans are approved in July. In August, American intelligence begins picking something up. The missiles arrive in September. In October, America has the first photographs of this, confirmed in mid-October. The chief of staff in America says the only solution is a full-scale invasion of Cuba. October 22nd, Kennedy appears before the entire country. Some here may remember it. And he says that there is nuclear missiles heading, is focused here on America from Cuba, and that any strike in the hemisphere, there will be world war, and we are going to blockade the island of Cuba to not let any Soviet ships coming. China announces they have 650,000 soldiers of Chinese people who are ready to attack in this. You have a world war ready. The, they, America puts a blockade. A Soviet ship goes through it. Actually, people don't realize they actually broke through. They continued working on it. Castro urges Khrushchev to, uh, to send nuclear weapons to America. He's afraid America's going to attack. He says, he send nuclear weapons. The world is one button away from nuclear destruction. At the same time, a secret communication goes back and forth between Khrushchev and Kennedy. And even that is on a pit. It can go in any direction. But something happens. It's only at one moment the closest we ever came to destruction comes to an end. And there was a secret in that communication that was never revealed at the time that caused the end of it. And, he, and, and that secret is linked to the ancient mystery of Pergamon. Let me tell you what that is as we bring this home for now. Khrushchev believed that if he put weapons in Cuba facing America, he would have leverage to take Berlin to get, to get America out. So he, it's again that city of Berlin. He wants that city. That's where the altar is. But secondly, the secret story is this. In April 61, Khrushchev is in the, near the Black Sea. He's near his Secretary of Defense or some official who points over the Black Sea and says America just placed nuclear missiles on the other side of this sea focused to Russia. That, we, that they, in a second, you could be destroyed. Khrushchev says, well, wonders out loud, what if we put missiles in Cuba facing America to do the same thing? 
The United States had placed missiles right outside the Soviet Union in 1961. And so here, here's this what happened. So in April, that's when, that's when Khrushchev says, let's do it. Then they put the missiles within months, and they make, he makes the decision next thing. So the, the, the crux of the secret communication was Khrushchev said to Kennedy, remove those missiles, remove those missiles here, and we will remove the missiles there. Kennedy said, we'll do it, but the condition is it will, never be, it will not be made known. We will take it out, but we'll, it'll be a secret. So that's what happened. So now here's the, here's the thing. The world was almost destroyed by missiles that were never launched, the missiles in this place that were focusing on Russia. Where was it? Where were those missiles that almost destroyed the world? The missiles were in Turkey, the land of the altar of Pergamon, the place where the throne of Satan had always been. The Soviet Union had the altar of Pergamon. This was now Turkey, the place there. Where in Turkey? Turkey has like 80 provinces, 80 states, so it's a lot of small things. They were placed in one small province, the province of Izmir. Izmir is the province of Pergamon. Ah. Oh. The missiles that almost destroyed the world were in the throne of, where the place of Satan, in, per, in, the, in the region of Pergamon. That, but, but not only that, not only that, and here, here you have what is the altar about? Holocaust, fire, destruction. Here the missiles are there in, in the land of that. But here's one more thing. What were those missiles? The missiles that almost caused us to all be gone in the, in the place, in the region of Pergamon, were called, they had a name on them, they were called the Jupiter missiles. Jupiter is Zeus. <gasps> Zeus oh. is the god of the altar of Pergamon. It's the altar of Zeus. It was ah. the missiles of Zeus in the place of Zeus, in ah. the place of the altar of Satan. And, and here, you know, it says in, it says in Ephesians 6, 16, it says the enemy throws fiery darts, you know. Well, the word in Greek is for dart, or flaming is puro, means to ignite, to ignite fiery. The word for darts is belos, which means, listen, not just darts and arrows. It literally means missile. Oh, oh my god. So here flaming missiles from the throne of Satan. Oma the whole world I mean and we've just <laughs> there you know it's a you see how real the Bible is. How oh, real you know yeah. people, when God you know when I, when I came to the Lord and people said I said I said okay I believe in God but Satan Satan is real so real and you cannot you have to ignore history ignore the J Jewish history and all that. It's real there's a real force. So let me just bring before we I mean, another time we will bring it forward to what's happening about the end times and this altar. But before that, let me just give a word from this quick word, and that is this. Number one, what does it tell you? Everything the enemy ever presents you with in your life, every temptation, don't make no mistake about it, it is there to destroy you. Every, everything, no matter how good it looks, no matter whether it's money, whether it's temptation of sex, temptation of an affair, it is to destroy you. So when you see that temptation, look through it, see it as if it was a man was standing at your door with a knife and so I'm gonna, I want to destroy your family, and so that's the temptation. See it like that. See the enemy who's behind it, he, who is there with one purpose. You give in to that, it's to destroy everything you love. Destroy. So treat that sin like the plague. Treat it like Satan, which is what it is, number one. Number two, the enemy is the destroyer. And so, and, and, and he's tried to destroy the Jewish people, tried to destroy the church, tried to destroy every one of us. And so what does that tell you? The enemy tries to destroy the works of God. He hates God. Anything with the image of God, he wants to destroy. So if the enemy is trying to destroy you, what, he's trying to destroy your life. What does it say about your life? It means your life must be important to God. Your life must be counting something for God. There must Amen. be a purpose on your life. Yes. There must be a, a calling on your life. Yes. That's why the enemy wants to destroy you. Otherwise, he wouldn't care. Amen. It's because of God. Because he fights the purposes of God. So therefore, what, what he, when he tries to intimidate you, invalidate you, discourage you, it's because God has a purpose on your own life, your existence. God made you for a purpose, for a calling for such a time as this. So wage that war. The Bible says don't, you know, don't abstain from these things which are warring against you. Wage your war against that sin. Wage it with, with fury against that fear, against that habit, against that entanglement. 
by the power of faith and the power of love, the power of the God of life, the God of Israel, because when all is said and done, everything the enemy tries to do in the end comes to nothing. When you stand and everything he's tried to do to destroy the church, the Jewish people, and the world could not do it because the God of Israel lives, the God of our lives is alive and well, Amen. and serve him and you'll be on the winning side. This is Rev. Michelle Mann. Thank you for watching, and God bless you.